The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Welcome to worship here at the First Presbyterian Church of Hamilton Square. We are glad you are here. Um, Pastor Kyle has fallen sick this weekend, and so you have me. Here we go. We're in this together. <laughs> It'll be me this morning, uh, and as always, Julie with me. So we will have a wonderful worship service, and we wish him well and hope he feels better soon. A special welcome to those joining us online. If you're uh, virtually worshiping with us this morning, you are part of our worship experience. We are very glad that you are here with us. Let's stand for the call to worship. Our hearts are ready. O oh Lord, our hearts are ready. We will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. We will sing praises to you among the nations. Let us pray. O Lord, we are indeed ready, ready to worship you, to offer you song and prayer. Hear our worship in this hour, for you alone are our God, and we worship you. In the name of Christ, amen. Let's sing together. Together we will pray the prayer of confession found printed in your bulletin and upon the screen. Opportunity for us uh, to share with God the things that we have done wrong and ask God's forgiveness. Let us pray together. Merciful God, 
We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind, strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Let us take a moment of silent reflection to make this prayer our own this morning. Now hear this promise of pardon from Scripture. All the prophets testify about Jesus, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. People of God, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. joy with one another as we pass the peace of Christ to our neighbor. Again, we welcome you to our worship here at the First Presbyterian Church of Hamilton Square. There's a lot going on in the life of the church, and I would encourage you to uh, take your bulletin home with you and read all of the announcements thoroughly. I'll just highlight a couple at this point in the service, uh, dates you can be aware of. There's a few dates uh, there at the front regarding February 5th. First, the annual reports are due. Just a reminder to all of our chairs and treasurers and folks that write reports February 5th uh, is the due date for annual reports. Also that day, there will be a rummage sale uh, volunteer uh, meeting, and you can check out all the info in that announcement. We have a few events coming up in our uh, in fellowship life of the church coming up in February. You can read about the church gala, which will be February 4th, that same weekend. And then the following weekend, the ladies' tea. Uh, want to make sure that you are one of our ladies, you check that out, ladies of all ages. This is a wonderful opportunity to get together, fellowship, and, um, and have a good time. So check out those announcements as well. Later today, backing up all the way to today, we have a children's Sunday school immediately following the service. The kids can head down to the youth room and enjoy some time together and uh, time learning about uh, the baptism of Jesus. And we have, as well, uh, opportunities to serve. Did you have something, Skip? Yeah. The annual meeting. The annual meeting, I believe, is February 26th. I will double check. That sounds right. Okay. That, are you quizzing me? That was like, I don't have my calendar. 
That's okay. Yeah, I don't have my calendar, so I thought we were doing a pop quiz. I, I think I nailed it, though. That's the good news. I think it's, yeah, February 26th, I believe it is. Sure. But double check me, because <laughs> I wasn't in that mindset. All right. Um, we have a couple opportunities to serve here as well. You'll see the Jenny's Pantry notice. As always, we can use your help in uh, getting food to under-resourced families in our community, a great, great way to uh, support our community. And then also, uh, we have our Shine and Inspire closets. And on that note, we actually have Carol with us to share a little bit about how it's going in Shine, uh, at Shine and Inspire. Tell us a little bit about uh, the program. So let's give Carol a big welcome. Can you hear me now? Okay. So thank you so much for having me. My name is Carol Feldman. I'm the founder and executive director of Shine and Inspire. And we are a local Mercer County nonprofit that is based on the mission of paying it forward. People can come to us for any number of things, but most important to us in the application is how will you pay it forward? What will you do for somebody else in the community? Not financial, it may be volunteering at the church, it may be volunteering at a food pantry. And a few years ago, I was having a conversation with somebody in Hamilton who told me that there were kids missing school because they couldn't afford deodorant. And I said, well, this is ridiculous. This is Mercer County where we certainly have a lot of money that could go in that direction. So my brain started working and we created the first Shine and Inspire closet. And I always put air quotes around it because it might be a cabinet, it might be two shelves in the nurse's office, and we filled them with hygiene items, school supplies, and non-perishable foods. We started with one closet at Ewing High School. That was our very first. And today, I believe the number is about 18. We've just added three closets. And we try to partner with local community members, businesses, churches, to help be a partner to that closet. One, to foster community relationships and to make new connections. So Jane Dahlgren contacted me and I don't remember how she heard about us, but said uh, that the church wanted to be involved. So you now sponsor two closets, which is amazing, uh, Robinson and Sunny Bray. And you'd be surprised how much need there is for hygiene items, for school supplies, for clothes, kids who come to school without extra changes of clothes, and some who have no food on weekends. So somebody in the school oversees the closet and they make sure that it's just discreet, that nobody's you know, sex, you know, pointed out that they, they're in need. And it's become a, the biggest part of our, of our uh, work now is there is a tremendous need just here in Mercer County that kids are going without food or important items like soap. It's just not things that you would think about. So I always encourage everybody, if you go shopping, just buy two. Buy two tubes of toothpaste, buy two deodorants. We ha also have collections around Mercer County. There's one at Brothers, there's one at Corella's Chocolates. So if you happen to be there and you wanna drop something in the bin, uh, that we're very appreciative of that. Uh, I wanted to tell you about our fundraiser that's coming up. We are having a Groovy 60s event at April 14th at Nottingham, which I understand is where you're having your event. We love Nottingham Ballroom. And this is, we have two big fundraisers a year. This is where we raise most of our money. We are able to get some grants so if you're interested in putting on your peace signs and your tie-dyes that you have saved since the 60s, some of you are my age, so you have some of that. Uh, it's a really fun event. There'll be 60s food, 60s music. It'll be a, a really great event. I, I know I have like three to five minutes, so I'm trying to get it all in. Um, so if you know of a school, if you're connected with a school where you know there are kids that are lower income, where families might, might not be able to afford certain things, let us know. One of the things we're asked for a lot, uh, one of our closets, which is actually a room, is with the Trenton Board of Education for their homeless and displaced. At any given moment, there are two to 250 children who are either living on somebody's couch or living in a motel or living wherever they can, basically, on a friend's couch. And we have a closet there, so that's not just serving the children, that's serving the families. So they literally go in and they can get whatever they need. 
And if there are additional needs, we will help them to do that. We are doing something, we did this last year, we're doing a Thanksgiving meal in February. At the end of February, we partner with brothers and they will make 100 meals for us to deliver to anybody living in a hotel or a motel. So everybody thinks about people at Thanksgiving and Christmas, but somebody who's homeless and hungry, it's 12 months out of the year. So it's just as important to think of people in February or in March or in September and because people get bombarded. A few years ago, we did this Thanksgiving meal and I went to one of the hotels and the woman told me it was her third meal that day. So what is the point of giving somebody three Thanksgiving meals on one day where it would be much more of a treat if we do it in another time? So we did that once in September and now we're going to do it in February. So we're trying to let, get the word out about what we do. If you have a business and you would like to sponsor a closet, that would be great. What that means, basically what Jane does, she emails the, the liaison at the school and says, what do you need? And then, you know, she just brings it to them. My, she just filled up my trunk again with things that your closets don't need, but they can be used in any other closets. So I could go on and on, but I know I'm limited in my time. We have a service to get to. So I thank you so much. I put brochures out in the front where your brochures are. So if you have any questions, call me, email me, text me. Everything works. Our, our mission and my personal mission is make a difference in someone's life, and it will make a difference in yours. that applause is not only thanking you for being here and sharing with us this morning, but a big thanks for all the work that you do and uh, your, your group does. Um, we're glad to be a part of it. If you look in your bulletin, there are particular items that we're collecting right now. It's in the Shine and Inspire announcement, and so feel free to pick a few up and you can place them in the bins down in our foyer. It's a great way to reach out and support children in our community. Speaking of children, I'll invite up our children for our children's message. Hello, hello. I have a question for you today. Have you ever made a mistake? I have. People are laughing because we all make mistakes, right? Sometimes in, in our house, we call them a whoopsies, right? We make a whoopsies. And we always say, it's okay to make a whoopsies because we can learn from it. And we can try and do better next time, right? But you know, one of the things that we think about in church is that we all make whoopsies sometimes. And sometimes we can hurt our friends' feelings, or we can do something that may hurt mommy and daddy's feelings, something like that. And sometimes even God is hurt by what we do, but you know what? There's really good news. God says, you made a whoopsies, but it's okay. I love you, I love you so much, and God's always, always loving us, always happy. Okay, I want you to remember that today as we talk about some whoopsies. We remember that God sees our whoopsies, but God loves us so, so much. And just says, it's okay. We can learn from it, and we can try and do better next time. Right? Okay, you are wonderful listeners today. Will you pray with me? You can repeat after me. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, God. For loving us today, for guiding us in every way. Teach us to care and not to fuss, because we know that you love us. Amen. Amen. You are wonderful listeners. And you can uh, get some children's programs right there if you want a children's bulletin, or you can head back to your seat or down to the nursery, whatever you like.
remain seated, but let's uh, sing together and prepare our hearts to hear God's word.
We've been working our way through Paul's letter to the Romans. We are in our third week, which means chapter three. And uh, when Kyle called me to tell me that he was under the weather and he was not going to be able to make it this morning, uh, we, you know, we game planned. We said, should I just read something by a famous preacher or something that has to do with the subject? But, you know, I thought to myself, I said, it's Romans 3. It's about the problem of sin. If I've been a preacher for 15 years and I can't write up a sermon on the problem of sin in a day, I don't know. Uh, we got bigger issues than Kyle being sick. So, so I have a sermon. Romans 3. I'm going to use slightly different verses than what he did. Some of them are the same. Some of them are not. But they won't be on the screen. You don't need to follow along or you can have it open if you'd like. But I'll be using uh, verses uh, 10 through 12, and then also 19 to 24, which was part of uh, what he had prepped. So, Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 10. It is written, There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, irrespective of the law, or another translation, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I can still remember, like it was yesterday, being a young boy and going with my dad to the movie theater to see Jurassic Park when it first came out. Now, that's one of those memories that ages me a little bit with all of you. A lot of you are thinking, you were a boy when that came out? <laughs> you are really young. But all of my youth are thinking, you were alive when Jurassic Park first came out? You are old. In the movie, in typical Steven Spielberg fashion, they don't give you too much too soon. You have to wait a little bit to really see the dinosaurs. A little taste or two in the beginning, but then after a little while, you get to the first really intense scene, the first scene with the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And this was the first movie that really used CGI animation, computer graphics and animation in a way that made it feel so real and lifelike in the movie. And I remember turning to look at my dad, and we both just had this huge smile and nodded. <laughs> Knowing that when that T-Rex thundered its footprint in the mud and let out a roar, that movies were never going to be the same again. And we were just fine with that. And movies weren't the same. And in that first intense and suspenseful scene with the T-Rex, a few of the people, a few of the actors, start fleeing the scene in a jeep, trying to get away from the T-Rex. And the T-Rex is chasing after them, moving at an incredible speed, getting closer and closer 
its huge legs thundering through the mud and its long, sharp teeth gleaming in the rain. And at one point, the driver looks down to see how close the T-Rex is. He, he looks down into his mirror, his rear view mirror on the side, his side mirror, and, and that T-Rex is just as close as can be. It is right there. And in a great moment of both terror and levity, right there at the bottom of the mirror, it says, objects in mirror are closer than they appear. It's good for a laugh, and it also puts you on the edge of your seat. In Romans 3, Paul is holding up that kind of mirror to humanity, to his own self, to the Jews, to the Gentiles, to all of us. A mirror that will give us a good look at who we are, who we really are, and what Paul sees more terrifying than a closing T-Rex. Because Paul sees sin. Paul looks at humanity and says, look, we have the law, but none of us live up to it. Not one of us. We have plainly seen what God requires, what God wants for us, and we don't do it. The law, God's law, is simply out of our reach. Sin is a problem. But Paul's going to take it a step further. He's going to look in that mirror, and like in Jurassic Park, he realizes the danger, the problem, is even closer than it appears. Or perhaps in this case, it's better said, even deeper than it appears. See, Paul realized the problem of sin, the problem of not being able to keep the law, it's insurmountable for us. See, we know because of testimony about Paul in the book of Acts. We know from Paul's own words in Galatians chapter 1 and in Philippians chapter 3 as well as other places. We know that Paul was as good as it gets at keeping the law. Before his conversion to Christianity, Paul was a Pharisee who kept God's law and holiness codes and rites and codes with the utmost strictness. He wasn't just a Pharisee, he was the Pharisee. We're told in scripture that he was a prized student, the head of the class, excellent at what he did. So you would think that when it comes to the law, that Paul, of all people, if he held up a mirror and took a close look, well, sure, he's going to find a few faults, but he'd say, not too bad. It's not too bad. But that's not what Paul sees at all. When Paul holds up that mirror, what he sees goes past the external, past the Pharisee that you immediately see in the mirror, past the strict keeping of the law and the holiness codes, past the ritual cleansing and the atonement ceremonies. This mirror looked into the heart and what Paul saw is that sin is a deep, deep problem. That it's worked its way into our heart, into our soul, into our very nature. Therefore, no matter how hard we try, we will not be able to keep the law. We will not be able to live the life that God wants for us. We can't keep up with a holy God. Now, it's not very popular to preach about sin. Many of my colleagues in ministry, other preacher types from all across the denominational map, they've given up the practice altogether. They like to get up every week and preach about God's love, the inclusiveness of our calling as a church, the blessing that God just can't wait to bestow upon us if we pray the right prayer or we live the right way, the, the mission that we have to serve the world. These are, these are all great things, and some of them we, we hit quite regularly here in our preaching at FPC. But Kyle and I will also preach sin. We will preach about sin. We, we won't shy away from it, even if it means that we risk making folks a little uncomfortable 
or sounding a little preachy or judgy, which I promise you we're not. Because here's the thing. It's in the text. It's in the text. If we want to do a series on Romans, we cannot get away from the topic of sin. Because Paul brings it up time and time again. Extensively in chapter 1. Here, extensively in chapter 3. Again in chapter 5. Again in chapter 7. Again, do you get where this is going? So if we're going to preach the text, if we're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we're going to preach the good news of God's answer to the problem, God's solution then we're going to have to be honest about the problem. And when Paul holds up that mirror, he sees it so clearly. The problem is sin. For everyone, even for a Pharisee, for a Jew, for a Gentile, for a Roman, for a pastor, for me, and for you. The problem is sin. It's a problem for everyone, and it's deeper than it appears. The second reason I won't gloss over sin is because if we're willing to get uncomfortable for a second, really hold up that mirror to ourselves first and then to our world, we will know in the deep places of our heart and mind and soul that this actually rings true. And in the church, we are interested in talking about truth. I mean, it's easier and happier and more comfortable if we just gloss over the parts about sin. If we ignore them, then no one needs to feel regret or shame or judgment or guilt. I don't want to go to church and feel guilty. But if we're honest with ourselves, if we're very honest, you and I, we will admit that these things are a part of the human experience. Part of the life that we all know. I know them all. I'm willing to bet you do too, that you've known regret over things that you've done in your life, that you've known shame over some bad choices or some quiet thoughts, that you've known judgment when you've publicly failed and you've judged others when they have. You've even judged yourself when you've privately let your own self down. You've known guilt for the anger that you've known or the kindness that you've left unshown, we all know these things. You, all, you know the often daily struggle of doing the things that you don't want to do and not ever doing the things that you really want to do. That may come up again in chapter 7. Sin is a part of our experience. It's a part of the life that we all know. It rings true. It rings deep. And we know in the deepest parts of us that when we hear this about sin, we know that this story is actually about us. Because we're broken. And we're hurting. And we're trying to get better. And this story is about us. And then when Paul holds up that mirror and sees sin closer and deeper in, than it appears, we actually feel like, hey, that's us in that mirror with Paul. Which means this gospel he's talking about is about us. That's going to be good news. So the problem is ours, yours, mine. And the problem is closer and deeper than it appears. And if a preacher's most important responsibility and greatest privilege is to share the good news of Jesus Christ, it might feel right now that the Apostle Paul and Pastor Doug are failing at that responsibility and privilege. And if Romans 3 was where the letter ended, or it were the whole of the gospel, it might feel a little bleak indeed. But Paul gives us a hint about where he's going. He shows a glimmer of hope, even at the end of this passage about sin. After he reaches the first conclusion in verse 19 that no human will be justified before God by the deeds prescribed in the law. The law cannot save you. 
That's what he said. He says in verses 23 and 24, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But, but, now they are justified by God's grace as a gift. The gospel is taking the law and sin and changing the story because of God's gift. That's the good news. And Paul gives us just a peek at it in this chapter. See, we can't keep the law, but through grace, God has reckoned Christ's righteousness as our own. He has made grace through faith, the new covenant, the new deal, the new relationship between God and us. And some of this moves beyond the scope of this passage, but for now, Paul is hinting at where he will be going in chapters 4 through 7, and especially in chapter 8. In a hopeless situation, there actually is hope to be found. Not through the law or through our own ability to keep that law and achieve righteousness, but through God, because God has given a gift. God has been gracious in Jesus Christ. That is the good news. And it's why Romans 1 through 8 is so important, so seminal to an understanding of the truth about our world and our God. Because sin is a big, big problem in our world. Look in the mirror, turn on the news, it's everywhere. But when we hold up that mirror, and we surely see that regret and that shame and that judgment and that guilt and that sin. When we hold up that mirror, we also see Jesus. We see a God who came down to us to stand in that mirror with us and for us. A God that showed up a God that saved us. A God that has a love and grace that is even bigger than the big, big problem. We see in that mirror, with us, with arms around us, a Savior. And that Savior is closer and deeper than we ever have. We've heard about opportunities to support our community earlier in the service, and uh, one of the ways that we support our church congregation as well as the ministries that serve our community is to offer our tithes and offerings. And so as the ushers come forward, let us do it with grateful and generous hearts.
Almighty God, we offer you these tithes, offerings, and gifts. This morning, in your word to us, we heard the good news of your tremendous gift, your tremendous blessing to us in Jesus Christ. So please take these gifts and do his ministry in our world. May they be gift and blessing to others, for this is what flows from our grateful hearts, grateful for your gift, for your blessing, for all that we have received in Jesus Christ, your Son. Maybe see. Or we're singing. We're singing, never mind. You can stand back up. <laughs> Sorry about that. sure this time. Let us go to God in prayer. O oh Lord, we are a sinful people, and yet by your Son, his atoning sacrifice, by this gift that you have given us, we are made righteous as he was righteous. What wonder and awe we have at this good news. Hear first as we come in prayer our gratitude for the God that you are, a God who saves, a God who forgives, a God who is good. Lord, as we look around our broken world, there is much to pray for. Everywhere we look, there's someone, some situation, some community that needs your healing, that needs the ministry of Christ at work within it. Call us to those people, to those pockets of our world. Call us to pray for friends and family, but also for the stranger and even for the enemy. Remind us that your goodness and your mercy are so wide. Remind us that our ministry and our prayers ought to be just as wide. Lord, this morning we offer up special prayer by name 
for Andy, Barbara, for Brian, Buddy, Christine, Deb, for Gina, Harry, Jay, Nicholas, Thalia, for the Whalen family and the Birch family, for all those serving overseas. And we also lift up these names. Lord, you know their situations, but we lift them up to you in heartfelt prayer, whether silently or aloud. Lord, you know our needs and the needs of your world before we even speak them. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for working in and through us. And thank you for your Son, the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and close worship in song.
Sin is indeed a big, big problem in our world, but the good news that we will hear about even more in coming weeks is that God's grace is enough. God's grace is bigger than the big, big problem. That is good news. Let us go forth believing it and living like it. And as you go, know that the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit goes with you this day and every day. Amen.